I was speaking uh, with my father-in-law and my mother-in-law recently. They had uh, done some traveling this summer, uh, and they had visited uh, the Little Bighorn, uh, where Custer's Last Stand famously was. And uh, because of that, and I had read some about Custer's Last Stand, uh, I, had, I went back and just kind of read up a little bit more. And, I, and what struck me was how committed he was to the plan that he had formulated before he received some pertinent information that might have changed his mind, right? He he rode out uh, with a very small force of of 200, 300 cavalrymen, and he had been told, no, 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 this isn't a small group of Native Americans. This is a large, there's uh, thousand-plus men there. They're, They're waiting for you. And he's like, no, 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 this is, this is going to be fine. This is, this is enough. He also believed that they were going to run. He thought that they would, they would flee away just like they had done in the past. And they said, no, those men are there to fight you. They, they, they want to battle you. He was also offered, before he left, he, he was offered uh, Gatling guns, kind of that early machine gun. And, and he said, no, no, it's fine. Uh, I, they're going to slow me down. He was committed to his plan. And he wouldn't change it regardless of what new information came away, regardless of what circumstances. I mean, in fact, he divided his force because he thought they would run and he was trying to cut off their escape route. And I just imagine one of his aides, maybe one of his adjutants sitting there and being like, George, do you think we should maybe take the Gatling gun? I mean, it couldn't hurt. I think sometimes following the Lord can feel like he's this committed leader who regardless of what new information comes our way, he's the same, which we love. We talk about Jesus being the same yesterday, today, and forever. But sometimes it feels like, is, is, is God just being kind of pigheaded and stubborn about this? Like the world's changing. The world has changed. It's way different than when he wrote this. Isn't there like a 2.0 version of the Bible where he can update some things and like give us new information, maybe how to deal with certain situations. Maybe we don't have to be as strict on some things as we are on other things. Like God, there's new stuff. Like why are you not adjusting? And we can feel a little like like some of those cavalrymen that were riding with Custer and being like, I've heard this is supposed to be a last stand. That's how this is going to be remembered. Like, we don't want to be remembered as being people who are are stuck behind this inflexible plan. And so as we finish our series today called Unstuck, we're going to talk about being stuck in God's plan and how it can feel like we're just cogs in a machine, like we're we're a part of this unit, this, this group of people that's destined to be destroyed for God's glory. And does God even care about that? Does God care about who we are and what we are? And and what's his plan for us? And so we're in Genesis chapter 45 today. And as you turn there, uh, as I said, this is the last uh, uh, sermon in this series. And we're gonna start a new one uh, next week uh, where we'll be interviewing and and speaking with uh, uh, experts in different areas. Uh, It's called In His Image. One of the experts is, I'm very close to her. Uh, She's phenomenal. Her name's Kim and she's my wife. Um, and she's great. She's not even in here, so I said that. You can tell her I said nice things about her. But it'll be a great series. Uh, it's going to be videoed over into here as well. So just be ready for that uh, in the coming uh, weeks. And so uh, as we look at what God's about to do in the life of Joseph, this is kind of the climax of the story. And I want you to see how God's plan functions. And the first thing is that you need to recognize, we all need to recognize that we are a part of God's plans for other people. We are a part of God's plan for other people. Look at verse one of chapter 45. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. And so no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. And so Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve my life or to preserve life. 
For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest, and God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt." Like I said, this is the climax of the story and it starts, it basically is Joseph's finally revealing to his brothers who he is. And it starts with him breaking down, weeping so loudly that even after he sends out the Egyptians, everybody's hearing it. Everybody's hearing this this weeping and moaning and they're wondering, what's going on with Joseph? He finally, these years of of running this this, uh, uh, agricultural empire has finally gotten to him and he's just kind of having a breakdown. He's having a good cry in his office. You know, he's going to be okay, uh, maybe. Uh, No, 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 that's not what's happening. He's, he's, He's overwhelmed by the emotion that's taking place here. And he asks this really question, the great question is this heartbreaking question. He says, is my father still alive? He's asked before, is your father still alive? But here he says, my father. And I think this is his way of saying, does dad still remember me? I know he's your father, but is he still my father? Does he still care at all? Has he remembered me? Has he, has he thought about me? Has he talked about me at all? And he invites his brothers, even though they're upset, he's like, no, come close to me, come close to me. I think the reason why he does this is because I imagine that in all of their interactions, there's been distance between them. He's probably been, been up on a throne or up on a platform and they've been far away. And so they may have gotten a good look at him. Remember when they eat together and they celebrate, he's at a different table than they are. And so my guess is they just haven't gotten a good look at him. And so he, he said, no, no, come look, come look. Maybe he has a scar or a birthmark that he's able to say, hey, remember that time you guys pushed me down into a well? Yeah, this scar is from that. Remember that? Remember that time you threw rocks at me? Remember this? Things that only he would know. He's able to call them in close. And they are terrified. Again, I understand why. The man that you thought you sold into slavery uh, and the man who legitimately has an axe to grind with you now has every capability to grind that axe. And you are very much at his mercy right now. And he says something really beautiful here. He shows insight into the plans and purposes of God. He offers them comfort. He offers his abusers, his oppressors. He comforts them. And this isn't like some moral high road where he's like, oh, I'm turning the other cheek here. I'm just being nice. No, Joseph actually gets it. He understands what God is doing. He's understanding what God is doing in his life. He reveals to them knowledge that he has that they don't. He says, guys, this famine, we're two years into a seven-year famine. This is going to be bad. It's already bad. It's going to get worse. And he says three things. The phrase that he uses in verse seven, look what he says. He says, and God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth. In that one verse, there are three theologically packed words that should jump off the page to everybody. One, he says, God sent me. That word sent is huge. God is a missional God. God is a God that sends people to enact his plans, to enact his purposes. He sends them. He sent the prophets. He sent Moses. The word apostle in the New Testament is Greek for one who is sent. God is a sending God. And so this thing that has happened in Joseph's life, all these bad things that have happened, it is God sending him. It's a part of the process. This isn't some plan D plan that God had. This is top tier, top shelf. Why did he send him? Well, he says, to preserve life. That word preserve is a very common word in the Old Testament. It's a fun word to say too, if you like saying Hebrew words. It's hayah. So say it. Say it without smiling. You can't. It's great. Hayah, right? And so... This word is, appears a lot, but in this particular way that it's used, it's likened to the way that it's used in the, the, the flood story when it says that Noah preserved animals and God preserved the people, saved them, rescued them. 
This word means to be saved. Joseph is saying, God has sent me here to save people, to rescue them. And he specifically uses this word remnant. When you see remnant in the Bible, your little theological brain should salivate. Be like, ooh, God's saying something bigger. God loves the word remnant. It's a good one. God is always about saving a remnant. Again, go to the Genesis story, right? What does he do? He saves a remnant. He saves Noah, his family, and some animals. That remnant is saved. In the Joshua story, Rahab, the walls fall down, everybody dies, but Rahab, a remnant is saved out of it. When uh, Elijah is weeping and moaning about being the only one that follows God anymore, and God's like, get up. I got 10,000 other people, a remnant I've kept aside for myself that you don't know anything about. Don't worry about it, Elijah. Let's go. I got ravens out there with some food. When he sends the exiles back from uh, exile, he calls it a remnant. I'm going to bring a remnant back. Remnant is a dense word. God is all about saving people, people that he has plans for. The remnant are people he has plans for. And Joseph says, I've been put through this because now I'm so powerful. I'm like a father to Pharaoh, which is kind of a weird thing to say because it doesn't make sense unless, and this is what I think has happened. I think the original Pharaoh, the Pharaoh who had the dreams that he interpreted, the Pharaoh that hired him, uh, we'll say, uh, probably has died at this point. And there's a new Pharaoh on the throne, a younger Pharaoh, his son, and Joseph's like mentoring him. Joseph's like the prime minister. So he's like, I'm like a father. I, I, I'm, I'm running the whole thing. God's plans for Joseph. It's so critical for you to see this. Sometimes the plans that God has for you are not about you. God's plans for you are not about you. You, Joseph gets this. God's plans for him to be sold into slavery, to be wrongfully accused of assault, to be imprisoned, to be forgotten, to be tormented by the memories of the life that he had, that was all God's plan for him. But it wasn't about him. It wasn't about him. Those things didn't happen because Joseph was a good person or a bad person. It wasn't about him. That didn't happen because God was trying to teach him a lesson. They didn't happen uh, because uh, Joseph was this immature, prideful little twerp that was just super annoying and God was like, you need to grow up, son. I know just the way to fix that. We're going to send you into slavery. They didn't happen because God was like, you know what, Joseph? I'm going to make you really wealthy and powerful. First, you got to go through like a 20-year internship that's going to be brutal. But after that, you're going to be really wealthy and powerful. That's not why it happened. God's plan for Joseph had very little to do with Joseph. Now, along the way, did he mature? Yes, of course he did. Did he learn things and grow closer to God? Obviously. Did God want to bless, him, bless his life and, and create in him this, this powerful position? Yes, God did those things. But that wasn't the point of everything that happened. If you think the point of the story is that Joseph learned something and grew more mature, you're missing the point. And not only are you missing the point, you're denying scripture because Joseph himself says, this is the point of my life. This is why all this stuff happened. Let scripture interpret scripture. Joseph is explaining everything that happened. I was sent here to preserve a remnant. Everybody else, not me. If you think the story is about Joseph becoming more mature or Joseph uh, having a purpose or God's plan, it's like really wanting some peanuts and so you book a flight somewhere. And you're like, man, I really want some peanuts. Let's go fly to Wisconsin. I can get me some peanuts. I mean, the peanuts are good, but they're cheaper and better ways to get peanuts. Might I suggest a Kroger or something? God did this in Joseph's life for literally everybody else in Egypt and in Canaan and maybe even beyond. It was about them and it was about God. It was not about Joseph. And the cool part is for this to happen in Joseph's life, he gets it. Like he understands that this is what's happening. 
He gets that his role is this sort of side character. He understands uh, that all kinds of people uh, will be saved and rescued through what happens to him. But God has used people throughout history to save and to rescue and to redeem people that had no clue about him or about a relationship with him. The Bible is full of it, right? God uses King Saul to deliver his people from the Philistines numerous times. And does Saul end as this mature spiritual follower of God? No. He's spiritually destitute by the time his life is over. It's heartbreaking. Cyrus the Great, Persian king who sends the exiles out of Persia back home. God uses him to preserve a remnant. Exactly the same thing. He's sent to preserve a remnant. Does Cyrus have a personal relationship with God? Probably not. Probably worships Yahweh as one of many gods that he worshiped. It's not just the Bible. God uses people in history to do this too. Some of our contemporaries, the founder of Chobani yogurt, Hamdi Ulukaya, I'm not spelling it for you, does amazing things to care for refugees. Amazing things. He's not a Christian. He has no relationship with God. George Clooney, last I read, is an agnostic, also does amazing things to help with refugees. There's a woman in Myanmar. Her name's Aung San Suki. Some of you may have heard about her. An amazing humanitarian. In fact, she's jailed right now. She was, I think, prime minister of Myanmar for a while, and she's jailed in a coup. She's such an amazing humanitarian that Bono and U2 wrote a song about her called Walk On. It's about her. If Bono writes a song about you, you're top tier, right? I'm still waiting on mine. Come on, Bono. She's a Buddhist. She doesn't have a relationship with the Lord, as far as I know. Very few people are used by God and simultaneously understand that they are being used by God and draw close to him in the midst of it. It is not the events of Joseph's life that mature him. If you think that you're going to go through difficult circumstances... You're going to go through hard things. You're going to go through affliction and you're just going to get spit out on the other side as this spiritually matured, sanctified person. You're wrong. That's not how it happens. It's not this automatic thing. Sanctification is not this uh, 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 dryer that brings in wet clothes and spits out a, a dry, sanctified person. That's not how it works. For Joseph to come to this conclusion, for Joseph to arrive at this place, he's got to spend years praying about it, thinking about it, talking about it. Lord, do you think he just woke up one day and was like, I think I'm going to forgive my brothers. No, he had to process this. And he didn't process it with a therapist. They didn't have him back in the day. He worked through this on his own with the Lord. And the way that God taught him how supporting his role was in the rest of everybody's life is they made him a servant. He served Potiphar. He served in prison. He served Pharaoh. It is through years and years of serving that Joseph realized that what God wants from me is to serve. The thing that makes us all very uncomfortable and the incredible thing about what God does in our lives is that you are not the most important person in your story. You are not the main character. Your life is may very well be more about somebody else than it is about you. In fact, I know it is. But many of us don't like that. We, we live in a celebrity culture. We live in a story, in a culture that is so laden with narratives that we always want to follow the main character, right? And we always identify with the main character. That's intentional. You're supposed to identify with a main character. How are you supposed to follow a book if you don't identify with the characters? It's very difficult. But imagine how many movies would be so flat, so uninteresting if actors and actresses refuse to take supporting roles. Robbie Downey Jr. just won uh, Best Supporting Actor, I say just, he, he won it last year, for uh, Oppenheimer, which is a phenomenal movie. But can you imagine if his agent called him and was like, hey, I got a supporting role for you. I think it's really good. You're, you're perfect for it. Uh, I think there's real Oscar potential here for you. Uh, I think you should take it. And he's like, well, am I going to be Oppenheimer? He's like, no, it's not that kind of a role. He's like, I'm not doing it. I'm Iron Man. Iron Man isn't a supporting actor.
So many of us are unwilling to be the supporting actors and actresses in the stories of other people, particularly in the story of the Lord. The Lord God himself is the main character of your story. So you're already a supporting actor. Why is it so hard for us to get behind and serve other people? And so if God is the main character, if, he, if he's the, the one to whom everything returns, the one to whom we follow, then, then you need to get to know him. You need to draw close to him. Your job is to make him look great. Spend time in his word. Spend time speaking with him and praying to him and asking him questions. I'm so guilty of this where I'll go through my day and I'm just boom, knocking out thing after thing after thing. And I'll get to the end of the day and I realize, you know what? I was so busy doing things that I didn't take time to do the most important thing, which is just interact with the Lord. And I don't mean like having a quiet time. I mean, just interacting with him throughout the day. So many of us are so task oriented that we don't really think about what we're doing. So spend time with him, serve other people, especially people that can't pay you back. How many people do you think Joseph rescued that never knew he did anything? That never knew he made a difference in their life? Love people well. Because God's plan for you is not about you. You're a part of God's plan for other people. Now, within that group of other people, there's a specific group I want to talk about next. It's not just that God's plan for you is about other people. It's about the future. God's plan for you is for the future. Look at verse 9. Joseph's still talking, and he says, Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will provide for you for there are yet five years of famine to come so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and of all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. And then he fell upon his brother's Benjamin, brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all of his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with them. This has to be an absolute whirlwind for the brothers. The brother you thought is either dead or in slavery somewhere in like some other part of Egypt that you'd never run into is now very much not in some part of Egypt. He's like head guy. And there's no real explanation about that. He's like, now here's what I need you to do. I need you to go and do this. I would be like, hold on a minute, Joe. You've got to give me 20 minutes and explain just how you went from the last time we saw you crying in the back of a cart with the Ishmaelites to being here. I need a story, right? I need some sort of information about how all this happened. But Joseph says, there's no time. There's five years of famine left. You need to hurry. He says it all and he's like, hurry and go get my father. Hurry and go get my father. Bring him back here to me. And he tells them this because he says, I've got a place that I've picked out. It's just for you. It's a place called Goshen, which may be the modern day place, Gesim or Gesim. And this is a place that's a very good pasture land. Jacob and his sons were uh, uh, shepherds and, and they had flocks. And so this would be a great place for them. It would have been close administratively. Uh, uh, sorry, it would have been close to the administrative districts of Egypt. And so Joseph would have been close by. They'd have been able to go have lunch sometimes. You know, we'll just meet over here at the Taco Bell right here and we'll just go there. There's a, one on the corner in that spot. And, and, What's even better is it's on the eastern side of Egypt. And so if they ever needed to leave, if all of a sudden being in Egypt wasn't so great, there's a quick way out right back to where they came from. I hope you realize how much thought and effort Joseph put into this. You can imagine over the years that he's been there, working and serving Pharaoh, going throughout the land, administrating all of the things that need administering. And he's like, oh, that place looks really nice. Dad always liked places like that. That place is really nice. Dad would love that spot. Or, oh, that place is nice. Oh, Simeon wouldn't like that, though. It's not close enough to water. Simeon always hated going far distances with his, with his flocks for water. and It'd be close by. And he's like, what's that place called? 
Oh, it's Goshen. That's perfect. That's excellent. That's so close by. You'd spend years maybe helping people leave, getting the spot reserved just for them. He's picked out a place just for them. And it's not just for them. It's not just for his brothers, not just for his dad. It's for their kids and their kids' kids and so on and so forth. He's thinking about generations in the future. And I know this, and I know why he's picking it out as a place to leave from, because he knows he can't stay there. How does he know he can't stay there? Because in Genesis 50, the very end of the, Bible, of the, the book, in verse 24, he says, And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. Joseph picks this spot out based on faith in the promises of God. No matter how nice Goshen is, they are one day going to have to go to another spot that God has promised to them. Joseph picks this out out in faith, not for him, but for generations in the future. Joseph is not a short-sighted man. He is looking ahead in faith to the promises of God, and he is acting on faith in the promises of God. This is something that as Americans, we are really, really bad at. We are very nearsighted as a people. We think about maybe ourselves, our generation. We might think about the generation to come. After that, we don't consider it very much. I discovered a a tool this week. Uh, If you like words and graphs, your productivity for the week is about to go way down because this thing is addictive. It's called the Google Books Ingram Viewer. Ingram is spelled in like the letter N, G-R-A-M, right? Ingram Viewer. And what you can do is you can type in a word, any word. And it's super fun if you're with like coworkers, you'd be like, hey, give me a word. And they will, all of them will do this because I did this this week. All of them will look at you and go, uh. And you're like, literally anything other than that would have been a word. But you tump, punch in any word you want. You can punch in multiple words. You can kind of have a wild card in there. It's great. And it will tell you over a set number of years, I picked 1,800, how frequently that word has been used over the years. It'll show a graph of like increase, decrease, all sorts. I mean, you can punch in pig. I think at one point I punched in Jesus. I punched in Christ and I punched in Jesus Christ. Interesting enough, Jesus has been on the rise since like 1980. But Christ and Jesus Christ has been on decline uh, for a long time, which tells you a little bit of something. People want uh, cuddly Jesus, but not Lord Jesus uh, is probably my interpretation of that. That's me interpreting the data. I don't know. But I punched in the word posterity because I was thinking about it and I thought, you know what? People always say I'm doing or used to say I'm doing this for posterity. I'm doing this. uh, I'm putting in this effort. I'm doing these things for posterity's sake. And what I found was I typed in this and I typed in descendants. And I found that those words since 1800 are in steep decline. People don't use the word posterity in books. They don't write about it anymore. And you might say, well, Travis, of course not. We don't use the word. That's an archaic word. Nobody says posterity. We use a more modern word like future. Well, guess what? I typed in the word future and guess what I found out? You're right. Future has increased since like 19 is way up. You might say, well, Travis, that proves you're wrong. We're thinking about the future all the time. You're right. We do think about the future all the time. But if you go look in a thesaurus and you look up the word posterity or you look up the word descendants, you know what the synonyms are for them? Offspring, heirs, children, descendants, generations. Posterity and descendants are concrete ideas that revolve around people. Future is an abstract idea. You can say you're doing something for the future and you could be talking about your grandkids. You could be talking about buying a boat and sailing out of Galveston so we never see you again. It doesn't, future is this abstract idea. It can mean so many things. But if you say something, I'm doing something for posterity, I'm doing something for my descendants, that is tied to people. And we do not think about the future state of people very much at all. And you might say, well, Travis, that's not true. I've worked very hard in my life to to have a great amount of wealth that I can pass on to my posterity, to my descendants, to give them the best start. And that's great. Good for you. Here's the problem with that. 
Most financial people will tell you, I've looked this up this week, I've talked to people, 90% of the wealth that you make that you intend to pass on to your posterity will be gone by the time it hits your great-grandchildren. By the third generation, 90% of wealth is gone. I think the, the old adage is one generation earns it, one generation appreciates it, and then the next generation loses it. If your plan to bless posterity, to bless your descendants, is a check, that's not a good investment. That's not a good investment in the descendants. That's not thinking 200, 300, 400 years into the future. That's not kingdom-minded. Do you know where the future of the church most likely is? I say most likely. I don't have a crystal ball. I can't look ahead like that. But if trends continue where they are, the future of the church is in Africa and Asia. If you were to rip Van Winkle and wake up 300 years from now, if you wanted to come to a church like ours, most likely you will have to take a trip to Kenya. Now, I'm not saying we should give up on our country. I'm not saying we shouldn't pray. I'm not saying that's how everything's going to go. Please hear me on that. What I am saying is, if you want to make an investment in the future, what are you doing to invest in the kingdom of God beyond the borders of this country in places where God is clearly moving and clearly working? What are you thinking about beyond this nearsighted little world that we have built for ourselves? Are you being like Joseph Believing and trusting in the promises of God? Or are you just, what's right here? I was thinking about this this week and I was spending time with the Lord and uh, I, I thought about countries and, and, and where they are in their relationship with God. And so uh, I got on Google again. I really got to maybe limit my screen time. And uh, I punched in random country. And there's actually a website you can go to called Random Country Generator and it'll just give you a random country. Again, amazing. Fun tools. I've ruined your week, by the way. What you doing over there? I'm doing my homework from church. That's what you can tell people. Just plugging away. And the, the country it gave me is the Maldives. Do you know where the Maldives are? Nice. The Maldives are a small little island chain off the southwest coast of India. And it is apparently lovely to visit. They make a ton of money off of tourism. Uh, if you're looking for a place for your honeymoon, guess what? Maldives would not be a bad place to go. You can do whatever you'd like as a resort. You can worship however you like. You can dress whatever you want. But at any place that's not on a resort, it is a lockdown, uh, incredibly strict Muslim country. They assume, they don't know, they assume there's maybe only 10 Christians on the entire country of 300 and some odd thousand people. They do not have a Bible in their native language. And they uh, report that if uh, the government finds a Christian, they will likely uh, put them into prison and then try and pressure them into recanting. And if they don't, they will uh, basically kick them out of the country. And so I've kind of decided, I'm, like, I'm going to pray for the Maldives. That's going to be my country. I'm Maldives all the way. I don't know if they have any Olympians uh, in the Olympics, but go Maldives. Because I want God to do something there. P find a country, find a people, find, uh, maybe, maybe it's ancestors, maybe whatever, maybe it's, it's, it's relatives, maybe it's a friend at work, finding out about their country, whatever it is, and start praying and seeking how the Lord might want to use you to raise up descendants. And if you can look ahead, how amazing would it be if 300, 400, 500 years from now, one, I hope that Jesus has already come back, but if he hasn't, May God bless the efforts that you put into raising up descendants in a land that you've picked out centuries before that God has put on your heart. Again, I'm not saying you give up on the United States or Texas or anything like that, but I don't think anybody would accuse us based on the number of options you have for Sunday morning that we've given up on our country. But there are 10 people in Maldives right now. There are people hiding in caves in North Korea so they can do what you do freely. Let us think about the future. Let us think about posterity and the descendants that God may want to give you, the spiritual descendants that you can enjoy for eternity. You might say, well, Travis, this is all well and good. I'm so glad that God's plans for me are so inclusive and want to include other people. But you know what? It'd be really nice if God cared about me. 
I need to hear that God cares for me because I'm hurting. Well, guess what? God's plans, this is how amazing God is. God's plans aren't just for other people and they're not just for the future. They're for you as well. You're a part of God's plans for you. Let's talk about it. Let's skip down to verse 25. And we're gonna change perspective. We're gonna look at this from Jacob's perspective now rather than Joseph. So they went up, the brothers, out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. And they told him, Joseph is still alive and he's ruler over all the land of Egypt. And his heart became numb for he did not believe them. But when they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father revived, and Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. This is the most mind-blowing thing. And I want to focus on the two different reactions that, that Jacob has. The first one is this complete disbelief. And I can't blame him for that. The son that you had, that you lost 22 years ago, not only is alive, but he's the most powerful man in the world. And on top of that, he's so powerful, he couldn't like catch a Southwest flight for like a weekend and come see me? Like you wish your kids or grandkids would call more often, my goodness. Jacob doesn't believe it. He doesn't believe it at all. And and again, I don't blame him, but Jacob also has a history of not believing things, of, of, sorry, of believing lies, right? Laban, his, his father-in-law, his uncle and father-in-law, switches his wives on him. He thinks he's marrying Rachel. He winds up marrying Leah. And he's like, oh, I just believe it. To be so deceitful, Jacob is incredibly gullible. His sons bring him back this bloody robe and they're like, your son's dead. And he doesn't even investigate. He's like, well, I guess that's his robe. Call CSI, like, get out there. When his, when his brothers come back, or sons come back, and they say, oh, you know, like, we're gonna, Simeon's down there, he's trapped now. Jacob even lies to himself. He believes the lies. He's like, Simeon's dead. That's over. He's so slow to believe the truth. He's so slow. It's not until he sees these wagons and he sees these riches and he sees these things that he finally thinks, oh, maybe God is doing something. Maybe Joseph is still alive. He's slow to believe the truth, which is how we are. We believe lies all the time and we are slow to believe the truth. When he finally does believe, he has this interesting reaction. Uh, At the end of the verse, he says, I will go and see him before I die. Jacob talks a lot about dying. Like, Chapter 37, he finds out Joseph is dead. You know what his response is? He says, I'm going to go to my grave, sad. That was 20 years ago, by the way. He's been talking about going to his grave for 20 years. Chapter 42, when they want to take Benjamin back to Egypt, he's like, you're going to, you're going to make me die. You're going to make me go to Sheol, sad, again. And they're like, dad, give the Sheol thing a rest. We just want to take a trip. Chapter 44, it's the same thing. Oh, my gray hair's going down to Sheol. And they're like, Dad, give it a rest. He's constantly referencing dying. And the way that he references dying in the story is dying empty, dying in sorrow, dying with hopes and dreams destroyed. But when he hears that his son Joseph is alive, he hears that all 12 of his children are alive and they're well. Joseph is very well. His spirit is revived. And what he says is, I can go and die now satisfied. I can die whole. I can die complete. I can go to my grave in joy. What has happened is the grace and mercy of God has outstripped the grief of Jacob. He didn't see it. He didn't know it was a race, but God has blessed him immensely here. The veil has been pulled back. Everything that he ever wanted for Joseph, the security, the the success, likely Joseph was going to be his appointed heir. That was given to him by God in a way that Jacob never would have planned. Do you think if God had sent an angel to Jacob and said, hey, Jake, I got an idea. I want Joseph to become a ruler in Egypt, but you're going to have to be departed from him for 20 years. Do you think Jacob in the state that we first meet their relationship, do you think he'd been like, yeah, that's fine? No, not at all. He would have held on to his son. He would never have given him up. Jacob's story ends happily here, which is amazing. But the Bible is full of stories that don't end 
happily, right? Jeremiah, he gets hauled off into exile. We never hear back from him. John the Baptist is beheaded. James, the brother of John, is killed. Paul is imprisoned. God's plan for you, I'd love to be up here and saying this, but it's not true. God's plan, I wish I could say, is comfort and security for you. It's not. His plan doesn't always mean comfort and security for us, but his plan is for you to go to the grave in joy and in satisfaction. To have a life that you can look on and say, I am satisfied. I am whole. I am complete. And the way that this happens is through a relationship with Christ. Do you remember what Joseph says? He says, I was sent by God to preserve a remnant. Jesus Christ, the son of God, was sent into the world to preserve a remnant, to rescue a group of people that he can call his own. And the way that he did this was by being crucified, by being buried and being resurrected. The, we were supposed to go to our grave in, in sorrow. We were supposed to go to our grave the way that Jacob first talked about it, empty, depressed. That's what sin had bought us, this empty ending in our story. But instead, Jesus takes on that emptiness. He takes on that incomplete life and he lives it. And then he dies. And all of that is poured out on him. And for all who have faith and trust in Jesus Christ, now we have this ending to our story that, that goes into eternity. The ultimate ending is a happy one because of faith in Christ, because of what Christ has done for us. And remember how Joseph tells his brothers, I have picked out a place for you. That's perfect for you. Jesus has done the same thing for us. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. God has a place for you that from eternity past, he has picked out and set aside just for you. And like the land of Goshen, it is full of flourishing and loveliness and excellence. And it's just right for you. And just like Goshen was near to Joseph, we're gonna be near to the king. And I know that sounds scary because being near to God, it's like, it's like, the teacher standing over your desk while you're doing your work and it's very intimidating. Because of our relationship with Christ, there is no shame, there is no fear. There's no sitting there waiting for God to wrap us on the hand because we've done something wrong. No, being close to God is a joy now. It is exciting. It's peaceful. But there is one particular way where Goshen and eternity is not the same. There will be no need to leave. There's no escape hatch. That is the fulfilled plan of God in our life. We can go to the grave satisfied knowing that our Christ has prepared a place for us. And all it takes to latch on to this glorious plan that God has for you is to recognize I'm not the main character. It's not about me, it's about him. And it's always been about him. And his death, burial, and resurrection was for me so that I could enjoy the part of the play, the part of the plan, the part of the story that I get to tell. He has invited me to have a role in the greatest movie and story that's ever been told. How could you turn it down? And I'm standing here as your agent telling you, you've got to take the role. You got to do this. You'll never regret it. You'll get much more than an award. You'll get much more than a golden statue. You will get an eternal relationship with the King of Kings if you will just trust him. Trust what he's done instead of what you do. Our God is not like Custer. Custer led his men in what some would call a glorious last stand. Jesus let himself in a last stand of his own. And he didn't drag us all down with it. He laid down his life so that we could all escape the death that was meant for us. And his stand is one that was awarded with eternity and resurrection. Give him your life. Don't keep following after empty, hopeless plans whether you've made them or somebody else has sold them to you. 
Give your life to Christ because he has plans for you. And his plans are for other people and their plans for the future, but they are plans for you. Take them. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for the plans that you have for us, the joyful plans that you have for us. And yes, they are challenging and scary sometimes and hard. And they involve disease sometimes and they involve debilitations and they involve hurts. But they also involve smiles and they involve celebrations and they involve friends and family. And so God, I give you praise that even amidst the difficulty, you sprinkle in joy. You make this life not just bearable, but in in many cases enjoyable. But God, you give us eternity and that will be a joy. And so Lord, I pray today that you would open up our hearts, help us to embrace the plan you have for us, which is following you. And we follow you in trust and hope. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen.